the Committee on Civil Law and Data Practices Policy Committee to order. Today is Thursday, March 17th, 2022. Uh, today's focus is largely going to be on the structured settlement bills, but we have a couple other uh, bills to get off our agenda first before we do that. We're going to do uh, Senator Bigham's bill. Uh, we are just at the last minute are substituting the House file 3247 in the stead of Senate file 3087. And uh, thank you to our Senate page, Anna, who literally was sprinting uh, just a minute ago to bring the House file copies over here uh, from the printer. This is with the House passing it. Uh, we are, uh, we are uh, substituting the House file here. So uh, Senator Bigham, we have uh, Senate uh, House file 32. 49 before us. Yep, Mr. Chair, I would move to take House File 3249 off the table. I believe since it was the Senate file oh. put on the table, we oh, should be good with the House file uh, coming now yep, in its place. I'm drawing a blank to the Senate file number. What? Uh... I believe you can proceed, Senator Bigham, oh, okay. since we're taking up the House oh, file. Oh, okay, that's, sorry. Um, yeah, I would, um, Mr. Chair, move that, uh, House file 3249B recommended to pass and sent to general order. Uh, we had a large amount of discussion on mm -hmm. this uh, last week, uh, but I know Senator Westrom uh, has some brief comments. And then we have one testifier who I'm going to request uh, be brief as well. Uh, but Senator Westrom. Mr. Mr. Chair, uh, we can go to testifiers first, then I do have an amendment uh, just to bring forward, uh, unless you'd prefer to deal with that first, but I think maybe it'd be best to do it I th after the test. I think, yeah, why don't you uh, bring forward your amendment first, uh, Senator Westrom, and then we can go to Mr. Weibel. So, Mr. Chair, I would move, uh, I got to check the number, A A1, I believe? Correct. I would move the A1 amendment. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members, we had a good discussion Last week, I guess it was on this uh, bill. Uh, it was through the testifying uh, and the witnesses we we heard. Um, it, it became clear that there is not a real check and balance, except for when the legislative auditor might randomly check uh, the database and make sure that uh, the database is up to date and has been cleaned up for members that are qualified or, or voters that are qualified uh, enrolled in the program are, are uh, cross-checked and uh, properly on the database and continue to stay on there if they're uh, in the program. And uh, if they're not, uh, there's no other check and balance besides just uh, if the work gets done at the Secretary of State's office. So this amendment would add a third party verification through the legislative auditor's office. Um, since uh, drafting it, uh, some other so, some some uh, logistical issues have been brought to my attention, and so uh, uh, maybe it's not the perfect amendment, but I think it brings forward the discussion of uh, the need to have a check and balance and a system that uh, makes sure these databases are are um, up to date as as much as they can be. I think the Safe at Home program uh, we all agree is a very important program. And as we're reviewing these edits or amendments or changes to it, uh, this, is, this is one of those things that came to light through the testifiers and the questions that were asked uh, last week. And so uh, that's, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to take any questions or other, other comments from members on the, on the A1 amendment. Thank you, Senator Westrom. So I'll go to online, um, Mr. Weibel. Um, welcome to the committee. If you'd state your name for the record and then, uh, uh, hopefully, I'm asking if you could hopefully be brief for us. Uh, I'd appreciate that, uh, but welcome to the committee. Thank you, uh, Senators. I uh, appreciate uh, being here with you. My name is uh, Rick Weibel. And uh, what I'm here to uh, bring uh, to your attention is that in looking at the uh, bills here, I think we need to step very carefully because there's been a lot of broadening and lessening of the requirements as introduced and I want to make sure that we're protecting all of these victims that are in the program. And we have to be very sensitive to this. And I actually appreciate 
So I'm actually against these bills because I don't think they're well thought out enough and there's not been enough due diligence. I do support the amendment of an expanded audit of the system so that we can actually talk to the program participants to make sure that their needs are being met and that any issues that are out there in public data requests, uh, that those members are being protected. I am aware of some of the government databases that are out there publicly available where it has been leaked that program participants, the victims, information is available in those data sets. And so before we pursue any further changes on any type of documentation that these bills, both the Senate and the House are proposing, we need to baseline where we're at now and the audit is a smart thing to do. I would really, really request that you table this until next year, until you have a chance to actually audit and interview and determine the needs. And I should also be talking with the Secretary of State and also this committee behind uh, closed doors to show you some of the information that I have where some of the uh, folks uh, information has been leaked unintentionally and we need to do a better job as a state to protect these victims' identities. Thank you, Mr. Weibel. Uh, so Senator Westrom, I've uh, indicated to you, um, we've, I've gotten a lot of counsel on this bill over the last week, gone over it with our, our counsel and staff and heard from different perspectives. Uh, I'm not able to support the amendment at this time. I think uh, these uh, are likely issues we can try to address down the road. Um, I'll also note for members, the House just passed this off the House floor by 131 to zero vote uh, just in the last few days or weeks or so. So um, that's where I'll go to Senator Bigham, the author of the bill, and then to Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, thank you. And I'm glad you mentioned the other body because I'm going to in a second here. But um, I would also stand in opposition of the A1 amendment. Mr. Chair, this is as previous testimony um, stated, the OLA has recently done a, an audit and um, every year by March, um, Secretary of State has to deal with the, the program participants and making sure that if they're voting that, you know, that that all was copacetic. Um, Mr. Chair, this has nothing to do with voter registration. This has to do with protecting victims of domestic abuse, police, prosecutors, judges, and those in high risk areas. Um, it's, I don't know <laughs> what happened where the path um, in this body has gone to bring conspiracy theories and everything else about elections into it. But Mr. Chair, just out of curiosity, um, are you interested in maybe knowing who the chief author of the Safe at Home program was back in 2005, 2006, the enabling legislation that brought this important legislation forward? It was then Representative Westrom. And the co-authors were then Representative Gazelka, current Congressman Tom Emmer, and former Congressman Eric Paulson. Mr. Chair, this is an important program and I'm not gonna stand by and let its integrity get drugged through the mud. Vote no on this amendment. Let's keep this clean. Let's bring it to the floor and pass it unanimously, just like the House did, to protect these victims of domestic abuse, police, prosecutors, and judges. I appreciate members' support on this bill. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, members, uh, Senator Bigham's attempt to mischaracterize the amendment doesn't change what testimony we heard. Um, and so I just want to bring it back to what we heard last week from the Secretary of State's office and uh, refresh the topic isn't about the program and protecting victims with safe at home. The question that came to light through committee process was 
is there ample checks and balances? And the Secretary of State's office is who offered us the feedback that nobody else can access or have a way to check this database. That's all we're talking about. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I just want the record to reflect that this isn't about the Safe at Home program that Senator Gazelka or others authored 15 years ago. It's is there proper checks and balances in place. And when the Secretary of State's office testimony revealed to us that there isn't except for a random check, that's what got my attention and possibly others. And so with that attempt, that was the interest in bringing this amendment forward. But uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I do look forward to continuing to try to work with Senator Bigham. Uh, I would withdraw this amendment at the time, and I do, do just have one follow-up question for the, for the author. Uh, Senator Westrom withdraws his amendment. You said you had another question. Uh, Mr. Chair, feel free to go somewhere else. I got to pull it up on the, my computer, so I'll just be a minute. I'm going to proceed to a vote, Senator Westrom. So, Mr. Chair, if Senator Bigham could just explain for us again the, the changes in section it's the last section on the bill. That's what I need to pull up. Section five, I believe it is. Mr. Chair. Senator Brigham. Yep, I'm in the, the uh, folks from the Secretary of State's office are in the audience and if they want to come over and again, uh, go over the changes of the bill, Mr. Chair, um, that would be helpful. Uh, who's here from the Secretary of State's office? If you would please be very brief again, members, if we're going to run over time. I'm trying, I'll, Mr. Chair. I'll have to bring you in this evening to finish structured settlements, which I'm trying to avoid doing. Uh, so welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself for the record and then uh, proceed to answer Senator Westrom's question. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Nicole Freeman um, with the Office of the Secretary of State. Um, I'm, the last section of the bill is Section 7. Um, that section deals with real property records. Uh, Amber Bouget was uh, the testifier um, at the previous hearing, um, the recorder for um, Hennepin County and representing other recorders from MAKO. Um, this section uh, makes some changes so that uh, um, as data is shared with other government entities, as it says, um, that uh, those other government entities, so, uh, Program participant would share a notice with um, government entities requesting that their safe at home address be used and that their real address not be um, put into public data. This just allows um, other government entities beyond the county auditor um, and county recorder to communicate um, with the program uh, and take action as they need. So um, it's a, an update um, that comes to us from the local governments um, to help them with their work um, and to implement this program or continue to implement this program um, more easily. Any brief follow-up, Senator Westrom? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, uh, thank you to the testifier and uh, members, I think there's still some work that needs to be done on this, but I understand. Uh, uh, we'll proceed to a vote. I appreciate that. Mr. Senator Chair, I'll renew my motion to um, pass um, House File 3249. Thank you. I forgot my cheaters. Um, and be recommended to pass uh, to the general orders. Thank you. Uh, on that motion, members, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion prevails and the bill is passed. Um, members, next up is uh, Senator Limmer's bill. Senator Limmer, I've been informed that because of an error at the front desk, the committee report from Judiciary to the Civil Law Committee actually wasn't yet adopted. So we don't have the bill officially to take action on today. We could do the discussion on the bill and then next week we'll have to officially bring it up and have a vote uh, that we can't do today. Otherwise, we're still waiting for our other author to, oh, Senator Utke just walked in. So up to you, Senator Limmer, if uh, you have testifiers here that you wanna share today, or we can just wait with the whole bill till Tuesday. 
determine uh, you want me to go to the test time table or to do that here? Sure. You could go to the table. Welcome, Senator Limmer. So discussion on Senate file 3487. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just that let the record show that I did make the motion in the previous committee to recommend to pass uh, Senate file 3487 and have it be sent to this committee. Uh, I don't know what happened myself. I but, don't know either. We're but, having staff was checking on that. But. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, Mr. Chairman, in the interest of our guests that were here and prepared to give testimony, um, uh, let's review where, where we've been. Senate file 3487 is the organized retail theft bill. Uh, many of our members are members of both civil law and judiciary committee. Uh, so we're becoming very, very informed about this particular bill. Uh, during the course of discussion, starting in this committee, um, Mr. Neumeister uh, found a technical issue with the original writing of the bill, which required an amendment. That was a civil law um, subject, so we could not deal with it in the criminal justice uh, committee or the judiciary crime prevention committee. So that's why it was sent back to civil law to correct that in the form of amendment. The amendment, the A2 amendment, is what I'd like to bring the attention of our committee to. And uh, I'll, I would uh, request that council give us a description of the A2 amendment. Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, the A2 amendment amends um, language on page seven at lines um, 7.27 to 7.30. Um, and that section classifies criminal investigative data. And the amendment deletes lines 7.29 to 7.30, which currently classifies that data as confidential or protected non-public when it's no longer part of an active criminal investigation. So now if the amendment is adopted, that data would be dealt with under current law provisions in section 13.82, which would generally make um, the information in this bill that's being provided public unless the victim themselves requests that their identity um, be uh, withheld from the public and classified as private. Um, and just for the committee's benefit as well, finan inactive financial transaction data like account numbers is already um, private when the investigation is inactive under 13.82. Thank you, Ms. Primo. Uh, Senator Limmer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that was the original purpose of coming back to the uh, Civil Law Committee. Uh, we do have uh, one test fire here that's willing to speak and uh, basically to the amendment. And uh, I'll let him introduce himself, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Newstad, uh, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record and then feel free to begin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Bruce Newstead with the Minnesota Retailers Association. I work with uh, some national retailers that you'd be familiar with, some regional retailers and some small Main Street retailers as well. I'll, I'll spare you kind of the problem that this bill overall is addressing, except to say that organized retail crime is a, an issue in retail. It's an issue in each of your communities and it actually doesn't matter if it's a small retailer, mid-sized or small, we're seeing that problem on a rise. Uh, last uh, week when the committee, Judiciary Committee heard this bill, they heard from the Minnesota Organized Retail Crime Association outlining the importance of the bill. That's an association of law enforcement, investigators, retailers, prosecutors that all come together to fight organized retail crime uh, together. To the provision uh, that you're talking about today, Mr. Chair, 
we certainly understand it actually makes a lot of sense that the data classification portion would conform to existing law. So we have no problem with the A2 amendment and think it results in an even better bill. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Newstad. Senator Bigham. I'll move the A2 amendment. Uh, since we don't have the bill, we're not able to take action on the uh, bill oh, today. I have both right here. You need to copy. I know. The official committee report apparently oh. got missed on the floor, is oh. what I was just told. I'm sorry. I thought you were looking for the actual bill text. Oh. I'm sorry. No. I still would move it for you. <laughs> it's a good bill. When so, we get to it, I urge, ur we, urge passage. Since we have uh, testifiers here, wanted to give you an opportunity to come and, and share the thoughts that you're going to share with us. Um, did you have an additional comment, Mr. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to point out uh, Commander um, Charlie Anderson of the St. Paul Police Department is online virtually via Zoom uh, if he's needed to help explain some of the intricacies of kind of how it works in the field today. Um, I'm not sure if he has any prepared comments, but I, I know he'd be prepared to talk about the amendment if needed. Um, Mr. Anderson, if you're online, I'm uh, willing to throw it to you if you had anything uh, prepared to share or if you're just here to answer questions. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Commander Anderson. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm at home with a sick kid upstairs. Um, I just wanted to let you know as the commander of the Crimes Against Property Unit for the St. Paul Police Department, I can tell you that law enforcement, to include our police and prosecutors, supports the amendment as it conforms data classifications to match existing law. It really does help law enforcement identify and advocate for victims through effective identity theft and fraud investigations. And primarily, it protects victim information. Uh, if there are any specific questions regarding the, the rest of the bill, I'm happy to answer. All I can tell you is that this allows banks and law enforcement to work together to basically identify victims, work quickly to, on behalf of those victims, and protect those victims' identities so we can hold criminal actors accountable. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Commander. Is there questions from any members of the committee? All right, seeing none, uh, thank you, Commander. Thank you, Mr. Newstad, uh, for being here today. Uh, we'll have to bring this bill up when we can take official action on it and uh, apologize for the mix up. Still not sure why that fell through the cracks, but uh, thank you, Senator Limmer, uh, as well. So, with that, members, we will move to uh, two bills that we have before us on structured settlements and members today we are considering uh, two bills that deal with the structured settlement transfers an area of law that first passed in Minnesota in 1999 with some recently published news reports bringing to light some deficiencies in Minnesota's law it's our responsibility to make updates to provide greater protections for Minnesotans. Uh, so that's the uh, goal that we have here today, just to give members kind of a, a structure or a process update. Um, I'm going to, we'll primarily spend the bulk of our time on Senator Utke's first bill, uh, Senate file 3463. Uh, that's the one that Senator Utke uh, chief authored from the beginning, um, and uh, hopefully, Mr. Deer, I believe you're going to help walk through uh, this bill for us as well. Um, then after that, we'll bring up Senate file 3636 that uh, I chief authored to begin with. I recently switched uh, chief authorship to Senator Utke. Um, that is the companion to the bill that is moving in the House. Uh, we'll have more of a briefer discussion on the differences that are in that bill uh, compared to our first bill. And Senate file 3636 also likely going to end up being the vehicle bill uh, that will end up moving forward as well. So uh, we'll take whatever language we work out, Senator Utke's main bill, any additions or subtractions we make to it, and basically copy and paste that uh, into uh, the Senate file 3636. They're also going to both be laid over today because the, uh, the um, supporters and stakeholders in this, uh, on this issue 
are still meeting and working out where there are a few minor differences still. I believe there's something scheduled next week, uh, early next week is what I've been told. So we're gonna give them uh, an opportunity to hopefully come to a full agreement together and then uh, we can hopefully adopt uh, what they have brought forward or consider uh, their report. So Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I agree. I don't think there is a, a lot of differences, but just some, some things that I have to get worked out. Um, and uh, I appreciate Senator Utke being cooperative and, and working on, on all this stuff as well, because this is a very important topic. My question is, do you foresee another committee stop after this? Or is this, it doesn't need to maybe go to commerce or, or anything, anything else? I'm just more curious. I have gotten messages saying it does and it doesn't need to go to commerce. <laughs> well, that's your, I, that's I, something I, for you to sort out, Mr. I've, Chair. Just thought I'd ask. I've just been informed it'll depend on what we adopt into the bill that moves out of here. Um, since I share my CA with commerce, I get a front row <laughs> scoop as to if they want it or if they don't. <clears throat> so maybe he'll elbow me and go, if you adopt this, <laughs> then it's gonna trigger a stop. So with that, we'll start with uh, Senate file 3463. And I'll note to the testifiers too, after Mr. Deere, as you come up, if you want to maybe highlight uh, both bills together, uh, in your testimony, that can help. But we'll we'll spend the bulk of our time focusing on on 3463 first, and then uh, any leftover discussion on 3636. Council and others can help walk through the differences. So that's probably the longest introduction to a bill, Senator Rocky, that I've given all year before kicking it off to our chief author. So <laughs> Senator Rocky, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You did very well. Um, if we could uh, have someone move the A3 amendment, let's add that to the bill um, and then we'll speak to the total bill. Senator Bigham moves the A3 amendment to Senate file 3463. Members, this is an author's amendment being the first committee stop. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Senator Otke. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Um, and I'll touch on the A3 amendment first so that you know what we just added. And then I'll briefly go into the, the bill and then we've got a um, testifier here, Mr. Deere, that will uh, give us a lot more detail. But the A3 amendment, which we just uh, adopted to this bill allows the court to appoint an attorney in any case to independently evaluate a transaction and advise the court as to whether the transaction is in the payee's best interest and the best interest of their dependents. Requires the court to appoint an attorney for the payee in any case involving a minor, or if there is any concern that the payee may have a mental or cognitive impairment. And it also requires the purchase company to file a motion to appoint the same attorney prior to a hearing if the purchase company is aware of any past court findings of the payee's mental or cognitive impairment. And finally, um, there's a, a part in there that requires the purchase company to pay the cost of this attorney up to a $1,500 limit. Um, and with that, uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, Senate file 3463 is our structured settlement bill as the chair uh, has uh, Highlighted here, a structured settlement is an arrangement for periodic payments. The structured settlement payment rights may be sold, and that process is called a transfer. Senate file 3463 modifies our current statutes addressing the transfer of structured settlement payment rights. This bill includes the current NCOIL, which is the National Council of Insurance Legis Legislators Model Act language plus language recently passed into law in Georgia, Louisiana, and Nevada, with more states looking at the same language we have before us here today. Sections 18 and 19 of the bill contain additional language which was passed in the three states of Georgia, Louisiana, and Nevada, and this includes the structured settlement company must register with the Department of Commerce, provide a surety bond, letter of credit, or cash bond to the Department of Commerce, 
plus the language addresses prohibited practices, private right of action and penalties. Um, the balance of the bill follows the NCOIL Model Act language and addresses required disclosures to the payee, approval of transfers of structured settlement payment rights, affects the trans effects of transfer of structured settlement payment rights, procedure for approval of transfers, and finally, general provisions to the bill. Uh, people have events in their lives when a lump sum payment is desired and they can transfer their structured sen settlement payment rights to a purchase company for a negotiated settlement. This bill further protects the payee by adding a number of safeguards. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would like to have you call on our testifier, uh, Mr. Deer, who will uh, uh, give you a lot more information on what um, we're accomplishing with this bill. Thank you, Senator Utke. I also uh, neglected to add before, members in your packets is a side-by-side -side chart that our council, Ms. Primo, uh, helped put together that kind of highlights uh, the two bills together and where there are similarities and some differences. So I wanted uh, members to call attention to that. And thank you, Ms. Primo, for helping put that together for us. So with that, Mr. Deer, welcome to our committee. If you'd state your name for the record and then uh, begin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is uh, Brian Deer, and I am the Executive Director and General Counsel of the National Association of Settlement Purchasers. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you on this important topic. Uh, NASP is a trade association, the only one that represents structured settlement purchase companies. Uh, our membership uh, includes 13 different companies in this space that originate these transactions, both here in Minnesota and across the country. Uh, for the last 25 years, our organization has participated in, uh, in every state legislature as well as Congress to help craft the laws uh, to ensure adequate consumer protections while permitting these transactions to be available for the individuals for whom they are appropriate and valuable. Uh, we also provide input to the National Council of Insurance Legislators for periodics updates to the NCOIL Model Structures Settlement Protection Act, which has served as a framework for state statutes across the country and serves as a basis of Senate File 3463, uh, with, again, as Senator Utke mentioned, with some additional consumer protections. In my experience, uh, I've seen both the benefits involved in these transactions uh, for individuals, and unfortunately, the great damage that bad actors uh, in the marketplace can cause if they're left to their own devices. Uh, like you, we were deeply troubled by the alleged conduct of companies, uh, many who were uh, not members of our organization, uh, which were highlighted by the uh, Minnesota Star Tribune last fall. Uh, we were uh, also troubled by some of the comments uh, that we saw in the articles by the judiciary that they did not have all the necessary tools that they believed uh, were necessary to review these transactions. Now, uh, this, uh, me, the bill that you have in front of you, uh, Senate File 64, uh, excuse me, 3463, uh, as Senator Utke mentioned, uh, goes basically incorporates uh, the NCOIL Model Act from 2016. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background about the NCOIL Model Act. This has been a document that was originated in 2004 um, and has been updated over time. As you may recall, uh, Minnesota passed this structured settlement bill in 1999 before the enactment of the NCOIL Model. And Minnesota's law in part was part of the thing that, uh, part of the basis which created uh, the NCOIL Model over years that has evolved as this uh, industry has moved forward with different refinements. We've improved the framework over time to give a um, structure for these transactions uh, to provide as many consumer protections as possible. Now, unfortunately, uh, as we've seen through the articles that were published last year, uh, there is certainly some room for improvement on Minnesota's existing law. Uh, there has been a number of issues that were raised in the articles, which uh, Senate File 64, uh, or, excuse me, 3463 addresses and with the addition of the amendment adds even additional protections. Uh, I would like to walk through briefly the provisions of that uh, bill, uh, just kind of walk you through what this law specifically does. Uh, sections one through 17 uh, update the uh, defined terms uh, using basically definitions brought directly from the NCOIL Model Act. 
essentially, essentially to provide clarity and transparency. Uh, but these are definitions that uh, are used across the country in these type uh, these transactions. There's a, a few additional definitions that have been added, which have been brought over from uh, the recent legislation in Georgia, uh, Nevada, uh, and Louisiana, which has brought the additional consumer protections, which we will likely see uh, suggested for the next NCOIL mo model update. Uh, section 18, uh, which is critically important, uh, involves registration and bonding. Uh, what this section does is essentially requires that any structured settlement purchase company that wishes to do business in Minnesota register with the Department of Commerce uh, to provide a bond or letter of credit in the amount of $50,000, which is um, designed to be a source of recovery if needed, um, if a structured settlement company were to violate the law. Um, and also holds that any order that is obtained by a company that is not registered uh, to do business in Minnesota would not be a qualified order. Uh, what, a brief uh, comment on that. Uh, there is a federal uh, tax rule, uh, section 5891, which uh, will penalize any company that obtains um, an order or purchases structured settlements outside of a qualified order uh, and punishes that company with an excise tax at 40% on a federal level. Uh, so having a qualified order is something that every company that is conducting one of these transactions is going to want to have. And the registration aspect of it if a company tried to obtain structured settlement payments from a Minnesota that was not registered, uh, that would not be deemed a qualified order. Uh, one of the reasons that registration is vitally important uh, and is one the registration uh, that has been passed in the prior three states that I mentioned. One of the reasons this is vitally important is that right now, uh, quite frankly, Minnesotans don't know who are doing these transactions in Minnesota. Uh, one of the problems that we've seen uh, in the marketplace on the whole nationwide is that there are some bad actors in this marketplace. I'm not going to say that there aren't. There are several. Uh, it is very simple if a bad actor wanted to bring a case under current law to form an LLC in a foreign jurisdiction, Delaware, N Nevada, several places, uh, to file a case in Minnesota, do a transaction with the Minnesotan, and then after that transaction is completed, they will likely sell those payments off to an investor or an assignee. But that uh, company, if they file a single use LLC, can then disappear into the night. Years down the line, figure out something that has happened that needs to be addressed. Uh, that LLC is likely never going to be found. Uh, there are companies that will set up an LLC to do one of these transactions. And then after that transaction is complete, let it be dissolved. So that's one of the very important reasons why we think registration is important, just so that uh, there is accountability and responsibility for people who want to do business in Minnesota going forward. Uh, Section 19 uh, goes into a number of prohibited uh, practices that are going to be uh, uh, beneficial for Minnesota consumers in this space. Uh, the uh, prohibited practices will add strength and uh, protections uh, in a number of different ways. Uh, there are a uh, fairly lengthy list of prohibited practices, including uh, failing to comply with the state statute, uh, you know, engaging in fraud, fast, false advertising, uh, failing to dismiss a proposed transfer when it is requested by a Minnesotan that they decide they no longer wish to move forward with their transaction and ask the company to dismiss the case. If the company does not do that, that would be a violation of the prohibited practices. It would be grounds for uh, later on the courts being able to revoke that company's registration. Uh, in addition to the prohibited practices that are listed in that section, uh, it, br it brings in accountability uh, by providing a, um, either the payee or uh, perhaps another company to bring an action against a company which has violated the Minnesota statute. Uh, if a company were to move forward with a transaction that violates the statute in any way, or if it violates one of the enumerated prohibited practices, a court um, could either suspend uh, that court, uh, that company's ability to do business uh, or revoke their ability to do business. So they could revoke or suspend that company's registration. So that if you have a structured settlement company that is registered to do business, cuts corners, violates the act in any way, 
or violate the prohibited practices, a court has the ability to essentially remove that bad actor from the marketplace so that they cannot do it again. Uh, section 20 uh, of the uh, bill uh, goes over the, the uh, disclosure statement. Uh, so to give you a little bit of background about the disclosure statement, uh, before any Minnesotan can uh, sign a agreement to move forward with one of these trans transactions, 10 days of advance, they would have to be provided a disclosure statement. Uh, there's, you know, a specific form and a specific, you know, has to be in large type so that people can read it. Uh, but what that disclosure statement does, it lists all the financial terms of the transaction very clearly, the payments that a person may be selling, how much they'll be receiving from those payments, uh, what the interest rate is of that transaction. Uh, and it also informs uh, the person involved in that transaction that one, uh, they have the right to go speak to an attorney, a advisor of their own choosing and that they should do so. And it also informs the payee that they should seek out and receive multiple offers before agreeing with any particular company to sell those structured settlement payments, essentially encouraging them to shop around and make sure they're getting the best deal they possibly can. Uh, but that's essentially what Section 20 covers. Uh, going into Section 21, uh, that covers essentially the process of uh, you know, the things that must occur for a court to approve the transaction. Um, essentially that none of these transactions can, you know, move forward unless they are court approved, that the court makes a certain uh, number of findings, including that the transaction is in the best interest of the payee, taking in consideration the welfare and support of the payee's dependents, if any, as well as a number of other factors. Uh, section 22, uh, uh, goes over uh, the effects of the transfer, what happens, um, basically the effects of the transaction with regards to the structured settlement obligor and the, the annuity issuer, those are the insurance companies that may issue the structured settlement to the consumer. Uh, it also uh, specifically makes clear that if a person ever wants to move forward with a second transaction further down the road, that that transaction goes through this exact same process of court approval uh, that it, you know, that every time someone wishes to do this uh, transaction that they go through this court approval process starting fresh. Um, section 23 goes over the specific uh, procedure of structured settlement transfers. Uh, this is an important section. Uh, one of the things that the Star Trek unit uh, articles obviously mentioned was, you know, people attempting to go judge shopping for lack of a better phrase. Uh, this section specifically um, requires that any of these transactions which are brought um, are going to be brought into the uh, into the district court of the county where the uh, consumer resides uh, so that, uh, you know, if you have a Minneapolis uh, resident, they're going to go be going to Hennepin County and so forth and so on across the state. Uh, this is um, specifically to make sure that uh, these cases are being brought where they need to be brought, where the people uh, reside, and that uh, one thing that we've seen in many other jurisdictions, and that was also alluded to in the articles, uh, you know, if a bad actor finds a place where they can get a deal done easy, uh, they'll take that option. Just make sure that does not occur going forward here in Minnesota. Um, additionally, uh, it gives other, uh, uh, as far as a procedure, it gives a little bit more uh, information about uh, prior transactions. Uh, in any of these uh, uh, 20 days before a hearing, uh, the structured settlement companies can be required to provide a notice of the transaction, both to the court as well as to any other, uh, the insurance companies or any other interested parties. As part of that disclosure, uh, they are, uh, structured settlement companies are gonna be required to give a summary of any prior transactions for a period of time just so that the court is aware if a person has either completed a transaction or attempted a transaction that was denied within a period of time, that they make those disclosures to the court so that the court is aware that has taken place. Again, we want to make sure that the courts have much more information than they do currently. Um, Section 24 covers a number of, uh, for lack of a better phrase, some catch-all provisions. Um, well, one of these things that uh, one of the provisions that's important that any disputes uh, arising from these transactions will be, uh, you know, conducted 
according to Minnesota law here in Minnesota, uh, just essentially so that if there was ever a dispute, some company either based in Florida or the uh, Pennsylvania or California can't force a Minnesota to have to litigate in a foreign jurisdiction under foreign laws. This is gonna make sure that any disputes that arise will be conducted in Minnesota according to Minnesota law. Uh, there are some provisions regarding life contingent payments, basically uh, providing some protections for insurance companies uh, as far as making sure that if there's a life contingent uh, transaction that there are procedures to make sure that person is in fact alive uh, when those payments come due. Um, as well as finally uh, addressing, you know, basically putting the burden of compliance of this statute squarely and solely on uh, the structured settlement companies just so that if anything about this uh, during a transaction, anything is violated, the company, the entity that's going to be responsible will be the company bringing this action and not the, uh, the payee involved in it. Uh, Section 25 essentially repeals uh, the former statute to replace it with the uh, language from the uh, current bill. And then the amendment, uh, which was offered, uh, is crucially important. Uh, what it does in any case, uh, one of the things that to, is crucially important um, is to make sure that judges have all the tools they have in their toolbox. Uh, but what this does, if it, a judge has any issues, any questions, any concerns that they want a little bit more investigation on, in any case, um, a judge could appoint an attorney that can review in much more detail uh, the facts and circumstances of why you know this person wants to move forward with the transaction, uh, you know how it's going to affect them, provide you know basically create a report for the court to advise the court in much more detail that may be possible during a hearing, as uh, you know whether or not one of these transactions is going to be the best interest of that uh, uh, consumer or the consumer's dependents. Um, in any case involving a minor or uh, involving a person that. You know, if the court has any indication that a person has anti, uh, any mental uh, or cognitive impairment, it requires that the court uh, appoint an attorney. At that point, uh, it's man basically, uh, the appointment is discretionary in all cases. The court can appoint an attorney in any case that the court deems appropriate. But in those cases involving uh, individuals who have, may have mental uh, or cognitive impairment, if those cases uh, were brought to the court or any court that involves a minor, it requires the judge to an appoint an attorney in those specific cases. Uh, also, it also requires that if there's any point that a structured settlement purchase company is involved in a transaction and they are aware of any court finding in the past that uh, the individual has any sort of cognitive or mental impairment, it requires before a hearing takes place that uh, that company make a motion with the court to appoint that attorney uh, to bring it to the court's attention to provide any information uh, in whatever means, either be it in camera or however the court wishes that information to be transmitted to the court to provide that uh, any information that a structured settlement uh, purchase company has uh, in those cases to make sure the court gets all the information that they need. Uh, and then certainly a similar, uh, Senator, as you mentioned, all the cost of that uh, will be incurred by the structured settlement company, so there will be no outlay of funds by the citizens of Minnesota uh, with regard to that appointment. Um, but that's essentially just a quick rundown of what uh, uh, Senate File 3463 will do with the amendment. Um, it provides a much more modernized framework from what Minnesota has currently. It adds some much stronger uh, consumer protections provides more safeguards um, so that the court can get all the information they need on these transactions, uh, essentially to make sure, and what we want to see, quite frankly, is that for people who these deals are reasonable and appropriate and would be beneficial for those deals to be able to move forward and to make sure we have the framework in place and give the judiciary all the tools they need to make sure that any transaction worth this, uh, one of these transactions is not in the best interest of the person that those cases are are able to be stopped instead of being uh, approved inappropriately. Um, I believe that's about all I have at the moment. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about the bill, and I thank you again very much uh, for your time this afternoon. 
Thank you, Mr. Deer. Appreciate uh, your walkthrough on that. Uh, members, I think I will go through all of our testifiers first and then open it up to questions or comments by committee members. So uh, next that I have on my list, Mr. Ron Elwood, uh, who I believe is remote. Yes, Mr. Chair. Mr. Elwood, welcome to the committee. Uh, identify yourself for the record and feel free to give us your thoughts. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. First, I would like to thank Senator Rutke and you, Mr. Chair, for taking on this issue and bringing it to the prominence that it deserves. I'd also like to thank Senator Bigham and Senator Latz for their interest in ensuring that we fix the problems highlighted in the expose. The importance of structured settlements cannot be understated. They are designed to ensure that compensation to victims who have suffered devastating, debilitating, and often lifelong injuries at the hands of others lasts long enough to take care of their living expenses and medical needs and those of their children and dependents. Congress, as Mr. Deere pointed out, Congress incentivized these structured settlements with the passage of the Periodic Payment Settlement Act of 1982. And that made, as he said, these ongoing supportive payments tax-free. What's really important about that is the purpose of that law was primarily to ensure that these victims would have enough money over time to take care of their needs and not wind up on public assistance as public charges. The Minnesota law and every state similar law, the Structured Settlement Protection Act, so-called, that followed in 1999 was a response to the rise of this industry and the problematic practices where at that time were coming to light. As noted in the October 21 Star Tribune expose, the existing law needs significant reform and I think we all agree. The revelations in those, in some areas were just appalling, for example, one shocking revelation was that sellers often get only a small percentage of the present value of their settlement. The series reported that on average, sellers only receive 40% of their future payments in cash. And this is a key area of difference between the two bills. Senate file 3463 at this point does not really provide any standards to ensure that the financial terms of the transfer are fair and reasonable. Of utmost importance, the series highlighted the fact that the judges say that the current law is vague with no standards or criteria to guide them in determining the fairness and reasonableness of the deals and whether or not they're in the best interest of the sellers. And that is another key difference between the two bills. Senate file 3463 at this point does not provide any meat on the bone, so to speak, does not give the judges factors or criteria to determine the best interests. Provisions in Senate File 3636, on the other hand, do address these shortcomings in Minnesota law. But I wanna thank the author and the others who worked on the A3 Amendment, which provides for an independent attorney evaluator to advise the court. This amendment moves the bill in a very positive direction. In sum, there are serious wrongs that we need to right that Mr. Deere made clear, we all agree, and I really look forward to working with the authors and other interested legislators, Mr. Deere and the industry and the other stakeholders to right those wrongs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Elwood. Uh, next up, Joel Carlson, welcome <coughs> to the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. I'm Joel Carlson and I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Association for Justice. And um, I've been peer, appeared in front of this committee many times since I've represented this group since 1994. And we represent those injured Minnesotans that we're talking about today that obtained those structured settlements. Um, and when we're in front of you trying to find uh, a law that provides for an avenue for average Minnesotans to get just compensation uh, or opposing a change to the law, Many times the people that are in these articles that you're reading about are the very ones that we're fighting for. Um, the, uh, uh, I won't uh, go into, uh, we've, we've 
shifted gears a little bit, Mr. Chairman, and I wonder uh, uh, if, as I talk, I want to talk a little bit about 3636, the other bill, and I'm going to refer to that because I do want to point out the differences. We've been working on this issue a long time, and I wanted to acknowledge the work uh, of the industry and the bill that they put before you that Senator Aki uh, has before you today. There are a number of things in there that I think are very beneficial, and I want to speak to those. Um, I'm actually uh, uh, enthused and encouraged that we're going to get something done in this area. Um, the uh, uh, Mr. Chairman and, and members, one of the things that we think is really important and is in both bills uh, on, uh, on, on 3636, it's on line 4.4 .4, and on Senate File 3463, it's on 10.13. We are changing who gets to determine what is in the best interest of the payee. Right now, it's not an adversarial relationship. Everybody goes into court saying, we want this done. We want to sell it. And the buyer wants to buy it. And the courts are left with, I have two parties here that want the same thing. Why am I going to step into that? Both of these bills change that presumption or change that method so that the, the court has to step in and make a determination what is in the best interest of the payee. Now, Mr. Elwood talked about uh, the best interest uh, considerations that are in Senate file 3636. And those are, um, uh, those are really important to us. And I think that we can blend the concepts that are in this bill with the considerations that are in uh, Senator Uckey's uh, underlying bill to make them a little more robust and talk about uh, the financial situation of the uh, of the payee, their family, their dependents, uh, will it uh, injure them from either obtaining or uh, or bumping them off of public assistance? Those are all considerations that we think are important, and we want the courts to consider. Um, we also think that a, um, a significant improvement was added with the A3 amendment. And you'll find that uh, in the um, 3636 on page five, line eight. And while I absolutely don't object uh, to the amendment, I think there are a couple things that we can do to improve that. Uh, namely, I don't know that you need an attorney to do this in every single instance. You may need financial advice as much as, uh, as, much as you need legal advice. And so you'll note in 3636, on lines um, uh, on page five on line eight, we allow the court to uh, appoint a financial advisor, a consultant, an accountant that can look at the financial uh, aspects of this and not just the legal ramifications. And so we think we can maybe make that um, uh, appointment of uh, voluntary appointment a little more uh, robust. This has proven to be extremely successful. They do this in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, and they found that uh, uh, when they when the court appoints a neutral or independent evaluator that only about 42 percent of the proposed transactions go forward and many of them just are withdrawn because they're not in the payee's best interest so we think we can improve that there's also differences in the bill as it relates to the discount rate um, uh, that is used and i think uh, mr elwood mentioned having a an absolute protection in there for the consumer so we know they're getting something valuable in return. The discount rate um, on 3636, you'll find on page six, line 28, they have a similar provision um, in Senator Eckie's bill on uh, page nine, line 12, but they are a little bit different uh, and we would love to have the opportunity to resolve uh, that as well. Both bills also add um, uh, a new provision that isn't in Minnesota law that requires the uh, court and the disclosure to include an equivalent interest rate. It's telling the consumer, if you were borrowing this money from us, this is what the interest rate you would be paying. People understand that when they buy a car, they buy a house. This makes them express that as an interest rate. And if you're paying 400% interest on a transaction, you're gonna think again. That's a very important protection. It's in both bills. Uh, in the uh, 3636, it's on page three, line 25. And on the uh, uh, Utke bill, it's on uh, page nine, line 21. Uh, lastly, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, it, we both have, both bills have provisions as it relates to prohibited practices. 
And I would only like to point out one as we discuss these. Uh, it also deals a, a bit with the A3 amendment. Um, the uh, Senator Matthews bill and, and the bill that we worked on just precludes the sale of a miners structure settlement. We've seen cases where the guardian comes in to sell the settlement of a minor and we think that's offensive. Uh, and we don't think that should be allowed. The amendment tries to address that, and I think it is a well-intended approach, is that in any instance where they try to sell a minor settlement, it's mandatory that they appoint an attorney to represent the minor's interest. And while we think that's an improvement, we'd like to at least have the discussion about selling a minor's settlement and whether that should be allowed at all. Uh, you'll find that provision in 3636, um, on lines, um, uh, page eight, line 29. So Mr. Chairman and members, we work extremely hard to obtain compensation for these people that is intended to last them and their families a lifetime. Um, it was said in the newspaper articles that some of these examples are cringeworthy. I would take another step and say they're disgusting. You have people that are selling off their life's um, uh, total support for pennies on the dollar. We have to pass this bill and we appreciate the industry and everyone that's working on it. And we look forward to getting a bill to the governor's desk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We're happy to answer questions when you get to that point. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Uh, the last testifier on the list is Robin Rowan. Welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record and then begin. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Robin Rowan. I'm with the Minnesota Insurance and Financial Service Services Council, also known as MIFSI. MIFSI members protect the financial security of Minnesotans through the sale of life, annuities, long-term care, disability, supplemental products, and retirement plans. MIFSI members pay out over 42 million per day in life and annuity benefits in Minnesota. Uh, in the world of structure settlements, life insurers are the annuity issuers. So what that means is once the parties um, to the original suit agree on a periodic payment plan to take care of the needs of the tort victim, an annuity contract is purchased to fund those payments. And so that's what the insurance companies do. When the tort victim sells their payments to a factoring company, the life insurer's obligation to pay doesn't change and neither does the tax-free status of those payments. When companies purchase the tort victim's payments, they are often resold or assigned and securitized. So think of mortgage-backed securities, but without the risk of default because the, um, it's, they're backed by A-plus rated insurance companies like uh, MetLife and Prudential. So we, you can see why factoring companies are interested in buying the tort victim's payments. We understand that there may be times when a tort victim needs to sell their payments, but we are concerned that the abuses by the factoring companies and the offer often what appears to be rubber stamping of the payments by the courts will undermine the viability of the structured of structured settlements. It can take months or sometimes years to put together a structured settlement that meets the health, medical and economic security needs of the tort victim. Um, and it's a plan that's necessary because the, court vict uh, the tort victim may not be able to responsibly manage a lump sum payment. If the victim ends up selling their payments at a significantly discounted rate, and they're only getting a portion of the initial settlement, then the structured settlements are simply not serving the purpose for which they were designed. That is why we think it's imperative to enact provisions that give the judges the tools that they are asking for, such as the ability to port, appoint an independent evaluator and specific criteria for uh, evaluating whether the, settle, the sale is in the best interest of the tort victim. Um, I'm gonna um, ask the committee's indulgence. Can I do both my comments? Cause they're kind of interwoven together. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, we think the uh, A3 amendment is a very strong um, improvement um, over what the um, original uh, bill had in it. So we like that change. Um, there are provisions in um, both Aki bills um, now a key bills <laughs> that um, we support, uh, some we're ambivalent about and others we think are um, a step backwards. Um, I was uh, laughing when I was going through the bills, I was feeling like I was playing that game that my kids play, um, kiss, marry, kill. So, you know, you have to get your, you know, your giggles where you can. Um, as I mentioned in my earlier testimony, um, the annuity assures obligation doesn't change once the annuity is sold. 
but there are significant new responsibilities that the uh, annuity issuer takes on. For example, there are, pro there are many more payees now. Um, the annuity is often me measured by the life of the tort victim, but now the tort victim is no longer part of the equation. And so um, there are additional, we have those additional administrative challenges as well as some risk exposure. So we want to thank Senator Aki because in both his bills, um, in section 22 and 24, um, in the one we're discussing now, uh, at, uh, addresses those challenges with the language from the NCOIL model. Um, there's at least one provision in Senate File uh, 3463 that we feel is a step backwards in pro protecting Minnesota payees, at least as how we read it. Um, and it's worth noting that all the questions, all the language that we have questions about in 3463 are um, language that are not from the NCOIL model. Um, the first can be found on um, line uh, 7.24. And it um, allows uh, factoring companies to um, pay finding fees to um, employees or other settlement employees of settlement companies or other settlement companies in arranging or facilitating um, a sale. We don't know why there need to be finding fees at all um, if these people are um, employees. Um, the second on line uh, 7.24 authorizes factoring companies to pay a referral fee to an attorney, a CPA insurance agent or other licensed professional advisor. Um, we don't, we, these are supposed to be independent advisors and we're concerned that if you introduce a referral fee um, that makes them less than independent and undermines the purpose of those provision. Um, as I said, overall, um, there are good uh, provisions in the NCOIL model. There are good provisions in um, 3636. And we look forward to working with Senator um, Uckey and the committee on putting together a bill that um, allows um, tort victims to sell their payments when it's warranted, but also provides protections. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rowan. Um, I will open it up. Is there anyone else in the audience that was wishing to testify uh, to these bills at the moment? Seeing none, uh, we'll go ahead and go to questions from the committee. So first up is Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't know if it's so much the um, questions, but um, two of the things that I've, as a I've been working on the 3636 bill that I think were of like the highest, most important thing for integrity of, of the framework for, for protection was really prohibiting the sale of these settlements for minors. Um, that is, it is just to me disgusting and atrocious that that would happen. So I do hope um, that to me is the number one thing we've got to keep. Um, in the bill moving forward. And as Ms. Rowan just spoke about, the fee issue is important again for the integrity of this. Um, and I think the bill that you and I uh, had, Mr. Mr. Chair, had um, I think really uh, upholds that high standard and I think really gets at the crux of what we wanna do and who we wanna um, protect. And so I hope as we're going through um, that, and I hope, uh, I know you're laying this over and I know there's discussion. So I hope that when we take this back up next week and there's a delete all that that is included in it, those two things. Cause I think um, we don't want anybody taking advantage of anybody. And that is what the whole point of these bills are. And we have a really broad group of stakeholders, Mr. Chair, that are working really well together to get this done. And I certainly appreciate learning so much about this, but I was um, just really upset when I, I read the, the Star Tribune expose on it. And so um, I just think we really gotta get at those issues. And, and I hope that these two um, are for sure in there. And then I do, I do prefer the 3636 um, independent evaluator. I think it's just, it's more than the lawyer, it's the financials, it's, a lot of that, um, and I hope we can um, tweak that out as well. So I don't necessarily have questions, just kind of more comments about what I feel are, are some of the priorities to really get at the protection of the um, of the bill for the settlement. Thank you, Senator Bigham. Uh, Senator Anderson. I don't know if that worked or not. <clears throat> Seems like it. 
this to unmute. I thought it already was, but yeah, don't don't uh, do it on your computer. Just use the microphone at the table. I didn't unmute my computer. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Rowan, you mentioned uh, in your testimony that uh, on line 7.24, the concern for the reasonable referral fee, and you mentioned that maybe there was others in that uh, how, uh, Senate file. Uh, were there anything else that you were gonna bring forward? I, didn't, I only heard that one concern. Maybe Senator Aki has got that. You can, I yes, think you're on Senator Rutke. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you can jump in and do this, but I think as you presented it, there is two, you got 7.19 and 7.24. And I think they've got in the testimony, they were both listed as 7.24, but you can address that if you like, but it was, um, there's a, a commissioner of finder's fee. And then the second one, which is 7.24 says a reasonable referral fee. So there's two different types of fees addressed. Go ahead. Ms. Rowan. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, thank you, Senator Rocky, for correcting my misstatement. Yeah, so 720 and 7.24. The second one deals with, um, a, it allows the factoring companies to pay a referral fee to um, the attorney, CPAs, actuaries, licensed insurance agent, or other licensed professional in connection with the transfer. Those are supposed to be independent um, professionals to help advise um, the tort victim about the wisdom of selling uh, their payments. And so we don't think a referral fee is appropriate. Senator Anderson. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And on uh, 7.19, 7.20, the finder's fee, you're concerned about that also? Ms. Rowan. Correct, Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson. Um, yes, they are allow, still allowed, they're prohibiting some finder fees, but they are still allowing a finder's fee for structured settlement, other structured settlement companies or employees of structured settlement companies. And we are questioning whether that's necessary. Um, we think it might provide um, an atmosphere and encourage sort of the abuses that we've seen in terms of hounding tort victims to sell their payments. So Mr. Chair. Senator Anderson. So Ms. Rowan, you're, you're suggesting that as we lay these bills over that we consider those two points to maybe not include them in the final bill. Ms. Mr. Chair, Senator Anderson, yes. Thank you. And members were welcome to make motions or amendments uh, to the bills before us, and then we can just lay over uh, the final products at the end. Uh, following up on that, Ms. Rowan, would you clarify for me uh, who's paying those fees? Is the payee paying them or is the settlement company paying them out of the amount that they get? Uh, could you clarify uh, that for me? Mr. Chair, my understanding is that it's the factoring companies that are paying them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Bigham. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I think um, I'm gonna take you up on that advice and I, I am gonna go ahead and <clears throat> move to delete the two sections that um, Senator Anderson just mentioned and Ms. Rowan had uh, testified in concern of. I, I just think it's a moral thing not to do that. And I think it is a, a problem. So I would move to delete in Senate file um, 3463 line 7.19. 7.20 and then 7.24 and 7.25. And uh, I'll go to council uh, for the amendment and if there's anything else uh, we'd need to consider in light of that amendment and then uh, go, to, uh, go to Senator Utke for comment. Ms. Primo. Mr. Chair and members, um, the, the am amendment is fine. I wonder if I can, I can't remember how it's phrased, but I you can give direction to Senate Council to make any technical corrections related to these amendments, inter, you know, semicolons, whatever. Renumbering. Um, yes. yes. And yeah. yeah. Getting a nod from Senator yeah. Bigham so yes. we can incorporate that into the oral amendment. Uh, to the oral amendment, Senator Utke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, we've had conversations here, so I'd actually like to have you uh, 
uh, call on Mr. Deer. Um, he will address the concerns here and uh, weigh in on those two, uh, two sections. Mr. Deer. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So with regard to uh, the section, which is 719 and 720, uh, regarding a commission of refiner's fee uh, to a person who is a structured settlement purchase company or is an employee of a structured settlement purchase company. Uh, the language in that section was essentially designed just to make sure that there was no, depending on how a uh, company is set up, uh, that if a person who is an employee or an independent contractor, for lack of a better phrase, who might be working for a structured settlement purchase company so that uh, whatever their uh, compensation is when that deal is closed and funded, approved by a court uh, for whatever purpose that they can, for lack of a better phrase, so that the employee who is working on that particular, uh, you know, transaction can get paid. So that's not supposed to be anything on court or anything else. Uh, just kind of a catch up just making sure it's clear that the structured settlement purchase company, depending on how they have their employees organized, can pay their employees based off of, you know, a transaction being funded what have you. Uh, with regard to uh, section 724 and 725 uh, regarding a reasonable referral fee to an a, a attorney, certified public accountant, actuary, licensed insurance agent, other licensed professional uh, in connection with the transfer. Um, I don't think we have any significant issues on that one given the, uh, the nature of what has happened in Minnesota. Uh, if it gives comfort to uh, you know, this committee to remove that section, uh, you know, I certainly, that's something that we're not going to have any significant issues on. In certain circumstances, we could see where that would be appropriate. But for this, what has happened here in Minnesota, if we want to go completely above board and make sure there's absolutely no uh, questions of uh, impropriety, if you want to remove that section, by all means. Mr. Deere, is there a concern of yours about the independence of the person making these evaluations uh, getting a fee paid, or is there maybe some way we could help phrase that in light of the concerns several of the testifiers and members raised? So with the language of the amendment, uh, you know, with that amendment language, which specifically requires the structured summit purchase company to make that payment since that is part of the statute, uh, if it is adopted and made part of the law, you know, it's going to be a provision in Minnesota law that, you know, the structure settlement company is going to be required to make that payment. I think the removal of that uh, language in 724 and 725 is not as problematic as it would be without that amendment, since we have that clarification of where that the structure settlement company is going to be the person that pays that uh, attorney or at the end of the day, whoever is making that evaluation. All right. Senator Brigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the other question I would have is we had other testifiers too, if they had any concerns about the fees. I, I think they were, um, Ms. Rowan was the only one that brought up the fee concern. So I don't know if Mr. Carlson or um, folks have, uh, Mr. Elwood, anybody have concerns about any of the other fees in it since we're on this topic, Mr. Chair? Mr. Knox. Mr. Carlson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, um, Senator Bingham. I'm not sure I'm following your question exactly. I, I heard the question about the appointment of the independent evaluator and the fee that is paid as I, as I read that on the A3 amendment, uh, that's paid for by the transferee, by the, per, by the purchaser. I'm not concerned about a, um, um, you know, a referral fee in that instance, um, I believe the courts would make that appointment. So on that instance, I don't have the concern. I share the concern about uh, commissions and referral fees, whether it's to employees, attorneys, agents, that, uh, that Ms. Rowan has uh, suggested. I had a couple other small areas to mention. Uh, I was here with uh, once, uh, former Senator Freeman testified in front of you yesterday and he said it was uh, 39 years ago when he first presented a bill. It was 1985 when I was in this room first conferring a bill and I feel like I'm doing that right now. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I do have a couple of comments on 3463 that, uh, that are usually brought up in this committee uh, and I'd like to at least put them on the record if we're gonna go through that bill. 
All right, um, we're still on the oral it's amendment yep. and Senator Brigham, I wonder if maybe we shouldn't divide it uh, to consider each of them independently, if that's all right with you. You're the boss. Um, and uh, we can take line 17 and nine, uh, got a, my numbers are mixing up in my mind. Page seven, line 19 and 20 as one, and then take the line 24 and 25 as a separate one. So which one would you like to consider first, Senator Brigham? Um, I'll go with the line 7.24 and 25 deletion first. Okay. Um, so Senator Utke, do you have any, uh, any uh, further comments on those two lines particularly we'll do first? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, I don't. Um, we heard from Mr. Deer that that would be acceptable and we'll go with that. All right, uh, any other questions from members on that point? Seeing none, we'll take up the oral amendment of deleting lines 24 and 25 on page seven. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion prevails. Mr. Chair, I'll withdraw the rest of the amendment rather than if we, that's fine. Okay. Uh, Senator Bigham withdraws the other part of the oral amendment. And then, Mr. Chair, I have a, one more amendment, oral amendment. All right, Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to, um, for Ms. Priya, I would, um, Primo, um, I would like to take on Senate file 3636, the part on the prohibited practices in section 10, paren 7, which prohibits the solicit or um, petition for a transfer of a structured settlement from a minor or a parent or a guardian of a minor. I'd like to add that into the section on Senate file 3463 under the prohibited practices section and renumber it accordingly. <laughs> What page so is that it's on? page eight, lines 8.29 on Senate file 3636. And I want to insert it into page seven in section 19 under the prohibited practices section, and then allow council to um, auto or, um, correct any um, numerical sections that she needs to. All right. I will let. Ms. Primo set that amendment up when we are ready. Ms. Primo. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, so we're going to work off of Senate file 3463, mm -hmm. page seven, after line 32, insert, open parentheses nine, close parentheses, solicit or petition for a transfer of a structured settlement from a minor or a parent or guardian of a minor, semicolon. And then re renumber the remaining paragraphs. That sound yep. to your intent, Senator that Brigham? That is my intent, Mr. Chair. All right, to that oral amendment, Senator Utke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, if Senator Bigham could just repeat the the line, page and line of 3636 yep. that you pulled that language from, because I yep, was the key. Yep, Mr. Senator Ch Bigham. Mr. Chair, Senator Udke, it's page eight, and it's 8.29 and 8.30. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll, uh, I'll have uh, Mr. Deer weigh in on that, because my question is going to be, um, I don't know how many of these have happened and would affect minors for very legitimate reasons. And I'd hate to eliminate that without knowing all of the details. And I will, uh, um, and I see we get uh, Mr. Carlson here that would like to weigh in and then we'll get Mr. Deere up here too, so that uh, uh, we know, because I'm just afraid of drawing a line and saying there's nothing there because I could foresee some very legitimate reasons you'd do it. So. Uh, Mr. Carlson. Mr. Carlson. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman and, and members, I jokingly thought we were conferring a bill here. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, but I'm wondering, uh, doing the Bingham Amendment, 
is all, would also require some pretty major surgery on the A3 amendment that you just adopted. And so I'm wondering if we've got the points kind of uh, laid out that, um, uh, that we need to work through with uh, uh, the advocates. Uh, and quite frankly, the industry has been an advocate for this bill as well. Um, and maybe we can combine those pieces and bring a bill back to you rather than line by line switching uh, them right now. Because if you adopt what I support Senator Bingham and what she's trying to do, but what you adopted in the A3 amendment would be significantly impacted by that. And I'm willing to, I think we all are willing to listen to uh, the issue of what a minor settlement might be um, um, acceptable, but that is when for sure we would want independent uh, evaluation and advice. So maybe we're better, we got uh, the issues out on the table, maybe we're better um, um, conferring this uh, um, among our, not among ourselves, we've gotten your input that's been important. I have a couple more I'd like to mention as well. But this one impacts about three different areas of the bill that we got to talk about. Yeah, yeah and please. that, uh, that yep. uh, highlights, at least for the stakeholders as they meet next, uh, that this is what the committee yeah. is flagging for them to work over. Let me have Mr. Deer give his thoughts okay. on the issue before okay. I go back to got Senator it. Brigham. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to kind of uh, dovetail what uh, Senator Utke and also uh, Mr. Carlson mentioned, uh, I certainly understand your concerns, Ms. Uh, Senator Begum. Uh, in addition to my role, I have also uh, served as a practicing attorney in this space and have been in court uh, on a number of these transactions. I absolutely, completely understand your concerns regarding minor transactions. Uh, from an ounce, uh, from a, a council role, when a any one of these companies sends me a transaction about them. Most of them have stopped doing it because I talk them out of it pretty much every time. Uh, I've handled these kind of cases, I believe over 16 years or so at this point, which means I should probably do something else with my life. But uh, in that period of time, I've had two minor transactions before. Uh, every other one that came across my desk, I blew it up before I made it to court. Uh, one of those uh, was a person who was a young lady who was 17 who basically had an amazing uh, opportunity to go work. She was out in the middle of, middle of nowhere, rural Texas. Uh, her parents were unfortunately fairly poor. She needed a truck, basically a pickup truck, so she could work at the job she wanted to work at before she started school to be a veterinarian. Uh, the other one uh, had an opportunity to go to a fantastic private school. Her family didn't have the funds to send her. Uh, outside of that, you know, there are circumstances where minor transactions make sense. I don't want to put in necessarily a blanket ban on it, but I want to make sure that the judges have every protection in the world in those transactions, make sure only the ones that need to get it done, get done. And with that, I, I and I, sorry for giving you probably too much information, but uh, you know, I want to make sure as we confer that we focus on making sure, uh, giving all the protections we can, giving the judiciary all the tools yeah. that they can, without accidentally precluding Minnesotans from getting deals done that need to get done that are in their best interest. And that's where some of our concerns come uh, with the opposing bill. But I certainly agree with Mr. Collerson. I think we're very close on most of these issues. I think with a little bit of conference uh, in the coming days, we can probably get to agreements on most of what, most of the items on the table and get to a bill that we can all be very, very proud of. Thank you, Mr. Deer. Senator Begum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you. Um, th that is my point. Like either we give them a lot of protection or we don't do them at all. So, I mean, I, I hope that uh, when we come back and, and after some discussion, we can do that. But it is a very legitimate concern. And if there is anything that we should do this session, it is to protect uh, the minors in a situation like this so there's not a predatory practice and we don't have issues like that's in the expose so with that i'll withdraw my oral amendment mr chair all right senator brigham withdraws her oral amendment uh, next senator johnson thank you mr chair i just i want to understand this a little bit better in contract law mr dear you uh, uh minors aren't don't have the capacity to to formally contract do they? I mean, so in selling in selling these uh, structured settlements, to me it seems like already there's there's there are questionable legal ground right there. Could you walk me through that a little bit on how that actually works, Sir, Mr. Deer? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. 
uh, certainly. And I, I will go ahead and profess some ignorance of Minnesota law so I can kind of you know put it in the guise of how it operates in my state. I'm sure there's probably similar procedures. Uh, first and foremost, uh, no minor, no one under the age of 18, obviously, uh, is going to be able to enter into one of these transactions uh, by themselves. They would either need a parent or guardian uh, to essentially act in their stead uh, to be the person signing the contracts. In my state, for example, we have a very specific uh, provision, uh, basically in the probate code, that is a uh, application for the sale of a minor's property, which is a separate provision that covers any kind of property a minor might have. Uh, so that we would have, in that situation, a joint application that would bring in that body of law, this body of law, uh, and present it to the court. Uh, you know, so in any of these steps, there's going to be a parent or guardian involved, whoever the, is the appropriate person of that minor who's going to be have to be involved in that transaction. Uh, no 14-year-old or 16-year-old can call up to one of these companies. Uh, God forbid they see the wrong commercials like, hey, I'm 16. Let me go buy myself a Maserati. I have money coming down the road. No one's going to do that. We're going to make sure that never happens. Uh, so there is always, uh, in any minor transaction, you'll have a parent or guardian involved. Uh, we want to add the additional protection of having the independent uh, attorney, evaluator, whatever that final vehicle looks like. Someone who's appointed by the court to review those transactions, as well as what other, uh, if there's a similar provision in Minnesota law, like there is in my state, where that whole another process. Uh, in my state, no minor transaction is going to get done without, uh, in our state, is a, uh, a guardian ad litem that's appointed typically, uh, but, or, you know, basically an attorney appointed by the court to review it specifically from that minor's perspective to make sure it's exactly in their best interest. Uh, and again, uh, those transactions are few. They probably need to be fewer uh, and limited only to transactions that are 100% of that minor's best interest. So I, I hope that answered your question. Senator Johnson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that, that did. That, that was perfect. And then can we bring that another step to and just talk about the, in the capacity realm, just the competency of the person that's selling that. So that kind of works that's a factor as well too. So if they're under a legal guardian over the age of 18, is that guardian then also signing off on, on the structured settlements or is that person, is competency brought into the issue? So Mr. Deer. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, uh, and Senator Johnson, I, I, I have to profess when I read these articles from the Star Tribune, the cases involving some of the uh, folks who uh, you know, did not have the cognitive or mental capacity or, you know, had limitations in that field. Impairment is the word I was looking for. Uh, those were very disturbing to me. Uh, in, the, in any case involving one of those transactions, if there was a person, uh, one of the safeguards going to the amendment briefly, I'll circle back to your point. I apologize. Uh, the amendment, we want to make absolutely certain that if there is any concern by the court whatsoever, that that person may not have the uh, cognitive or mental uh, uh, capacity that they need to, or if there's any impairment whatsoever, that the court has to, in that circumstance, appoint someone to look out for them. Uh, if the company is aware of any sort of impairment whatsoever, the company is required under the amendment, before it even makes it to a hearing, to make a motion for that appointment. Again, to, give, to make sure that there's all the protections in the world for that person. Uh, if there was a person who was uh, placed under a guardianship uh, by a court uh, so that an existing guardianship or other kind of mechanism was put in place so someone else was in charge of that person's financial affairs, uh, that person would be the, whoever was appointed by the court uh, would be the person who would have to bring one of these actions if it was appropriate. Uh, and then with all the additional safeguards we're building in here. Uh, again, that was one of the most disturbing portions of the Star Tribune articles for me. Um, I think that is something that, you know, I know that uh, both of these bills are seeking to address, and I think it's something that we absolutely have to address. Uh, again, the thing that we want to make sure at the end of the day is that Minnesotans who have a good reason to do one of these transactions can continue to do them if it's going to be in their best interest, and to absolutely make sure we have the protections so that people who might suffer some sort of impairment that they have all the protections in the world 
that a court does not approve a transaction and that's not in their best interest. Senator Johnson. All right. Any other discussion from members? Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just ask as the parties get together to talk about things, um, and I know it's on your list, but I'll just uh, emphasize looking back at this commissioner finder's fee issue, page seven lines 19 and 20, um, the way it's written, if the intent is to make sure that employees who are doing work on the transaction get properly compensated, I don't have a problem with that. I do have a problem with all sorts of other kinds of payments that would be included as permissible in the language that's in the proposed bill right now. So if, if tighten up the language, if you would, I'd be a lot more comfortable with it. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Latz. Senator Westrom. Chair, um, just briefly, uh, can you re remind me uh, what what the plan is on these bills, uh, laying them over and let letting the stakeholders work, or what what's the what's the demise of that? That's correct, uh, Senator Westrom. Uh, after any more markups or amendments are enacted, we'll lay these bills over. Uh, the advocates, I believe, are planning to meet again next week, and I'm hoping to hear good news resulting from that. And then uh, when we get back here, um, Senate file 3636 will be the vehicle bill for whatever the language uh, this committee will agree to and send out, since that is the one that has a House companion. Okay. Mr. Chair, just, just comments while they're soaking it in. Um, I, I, there's, there's quite a balance here. Um, and I just share the concerns of uh, making sure people are informed uh, adequately. Uh, we don't always know the reasons why somebody might be in a spot uh, where they wanna buy a house, buy a car, uh, do something that's you know life-changing. Oops, sorry. Um, but my, my the other the other side of it is I don't want us to get to the point where uh, the option isn't available for consumers out there, and and I don't think that's where anybody's going. But I just share that. Uh, seems to me that maybe at least uh, what we do in other play, other uh, parts of the statutes and law is we uh, require conspicuous notices or uh, disclosures, uh, kind of like a pre-lien wa waiver uh, for home builders uh, that, that they're notified that this is what's gonna happen. Um, something similar where maybe if people are doing this, they have to get a, a sheet. Maybe there's a central repository where other uh, structured settlement companies are available to be contacted so uh, they can do their own shopping, but uh, uh, just a simple notice uh, might be a way to um, inform consumers and uh, not have them thinking that, oh, there's only one company out there that might do this. Um, and, and so I think some practical things like that might help just bring a lot of uh, transparency and, and knowledge to the market or the consumer that isn't otherwise always so obvious or easy to, to, to find unless you're sophisticated in dealing with this. Um, but I don't wanna go so far that we regulate it and the end result is the consumers don't have don't have options to, to pick from uh, competitively. And um, there are circumstances where it's, th these, these make sense and I, uh, I'm just wanting us to find that balance. So with that, Mr. Chair, just, just comments as, as uh, they continue to work forward. Thank you, Senator Westrom. Any further discussion from members? Seeing none, any final comments from you, Senator Utke? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And are you going to, I know we're running, we run into the overtime hour here already. Are we going to do anything on 3636 or are you going to cut at this point, think it's all been discussed in, in, together already at this point? I think they've been discussed together yeah. enough sufficiently. I think the testifiers did a good job of going back and forth uh, along the way as they needed to. Um, do you have anything more on yep. it you want to add? I, I do just briefly, and I think you guys probably all got the side-by-side uh, -side provided by Ms. Primo uh, in your packets. Um, and 
please uh, take a look at that as we work on it from our side. One of the big things that jumps out is uh, with 3636 currently, it does not have, the, it's, it's blank there on the registration and surety bond. And we heard about the importance and the safeguards that those things provide. So that's just one of the big differences, but we will, we will continue to work on this and uh, bring you back something next week that uh, everybody thinks is a great bill. And uh, we'll let you finalize it at that point. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Rutke. Uh, many of the folks out in the audience have come and spoken to me and probably to many of the members on this committee once or multiple times on this issue over the last few months. And I'm glad that there's been a lot of work. Um, initially, I kind of thought there might be two versions far apart. Uh, and then we got into session and it seemed like actually we weren't all that far apart and we've been moving closer and closer. So you all, I think, have heard your marching orders as members have uh, indicated their concerns that they've highlighted in this and uh, look forward to hopefully some good news as you keep hammering this out. So with that, Senate file 3463 and 3636 are laid over for free future consideration. And members, that concludes our committee. We stand adjourned.